Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. A round of applause for me, I guess. Thank you. Of hard-hitting points given today, I think there, 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 there really isn't enough time in gatherings like this for us to exhaustively listen to people and hear the kinds of things they have to say based on a lot of the very relevant data that has come out from work that they have done. Uh, I know that a lot of us have questions on how we can you know, scale up some of their recommendations or perhaps expand some of the points that they have raised. Uh, I myself have some very critical questions. And I think now is the time to really have these conversations, seeing as this government is no more incoming and is now very much present. So I would like to politely call upon our three remaining speakers to come and have their seats. Uh, I would take maybe one or two questions, or rather I would ask one questions myself, and then we would have, uh, say, one maximum of two questions for the speakers from the audience as well, so we can wrap things up and we can get to the networking, as I was told. So uh, thank you very much, and please you are warmly welcome to the stage once again. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. So I think I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Oyedele, or Dr. Oyedele, as it were. Uh, great presentation. I think I was wowed primarily by how much Nigeria is losing in terms of money, monies it can make from taxation. And it really brings to bear some challenges that were noticed in the previous administration relating to not just, monetary pol not just a fiscal policy, but also monetary policy. And for anyone that has gone through the uh, Presidential Advisory Council's presentation, you know, you mentioned one of your recommendations was to create some sort of collaborative body between fiscal and monetary uh, uh, policy. There may be indications that that might be taken up. And in your view, uh, to ensure that fiscal and monetary policy is unified, platform works, uh, how do you think it can be achieved? Uh, what do you think the, the strategies and the approach of that yet to be constituted, if ever will be, body of fiscal and monetary authority? Oh, by the way, uh, the uh, PAC advised that it also include the vice president, the minister for trade and industry, and I think the chief of staff, if I'm not mistaken. But go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, to address that question there, it has two dimensions. So one is in terms of the revenue administration in Nigeria. So it's fragmented at the moment. So what you need to do is pull all the revenue collection functions into one entity, and that should be the FRS at the center. The same thing should happen at the state le levels. It should be only the internal revenue service. And then the agencies that are core to revenue collection, you should merge them. So for example, the Nigerian Custom Service should be merged with the FRS. This is what you find in many countries. Ghana Revenue Authority, Kenya Revenue Authority, South African Revenue Service, HMRC, HMRC in the UK. So pull them together under one umbrella. So that way, um, you are able to leverage on their skill and their skill and be able to collect taxes more effectively. So, and then the agencies that are spread, you know, over a thousand of them, can then focus on their primary purpose instead of chasing revenue. The second dimension of that question is the uh, connectivity between monetary and fiscal policy in particular, but even more broadly with other economic policies. So you see uh, Naira redesign policy. The CBI did not even think about tax collection. Anywhere in the world, when you do currency redesign, tax revenue is one or number two objective of why you are doing it, because people are bringing out currency, you're asking them questions, have you paid taxes? Um, you see the central bank still has a list of 43 items, not eligible for FX. That's also the lack of connection between fiscal and monetary, because what you need to do is don't unnecessarily heat up 
the forex market, allow everybody to go there so, to the extent that what they're doing is legitimate, and then use fiscal policy to discourage the consumption you don't want people to import. For example, I can say the import duties on toothpick is 200%, so that way you don't want to import it, you produce it locally. And then uh, in addition to that, you also have uh, the disconnect in terms of, as we speak today, there are taxes that by law you are supposed to pay in foreign currency. In a country where you spend Naira, and you have government agencies asking for levies, also in dollars, that does not increase the supply of FX in Nigeria, but it increases the demand for FX, and therefore uh, helps towards depreciating your currency instead of helping it to stabilize. So these are some of the initiatives that government needs to work on. And one of the recommendations is, the same way we have the Monetary Policy Committee, why don't you have the Fiscal Policy Committee and then let them interact regularly? And uh, not only at the center, but also maybe FAC. Instead of saying you are going to Abuja to share money, nobody should be sharing money. You should have a system that credits the account of every state and local government on a daily basis and turn FAC to a platform for collaboration around fiscal policy and tax uh, you know, uh, ideas for the country as a whole. Thank you so much for that, sir. Great, great response. I, I just remembered that a lot of what budget does is also at the subnational level, as opposed to just you know, federal. Of course, this particular question isn't something you can ask Mr. Oedili to sort of um, disaggregate for the states, since states don't have any control over monetary policy. But I, I would like, you know, in the responses from my esteemed panelists to also consider potential pathways for things that states can also do, uh, seeing as, you know, Nigerians are citizens of states as well. Thank you very much uh, for that response. So I'd like to come to uh, Mr. Denike and great presentation on MSEs plus the M, which is the micro, which seems to be missing as you have said, and I think that was a very interesting point you made, and really opened my mind to just how challenging the business environment might be for micro enterprises. And I suspect that most of them become small and medium and large enterprises where the, the required interventions or the programs exist. So going back to that particular question on leapfrogging from micro to small or to medium. What do you think are like the top three critical areas? I know you listed about five earlier and you broke them down, but if you were to, if you were put on the spot and said, what are the three areas that can, en can enable micro enterprises to make that great leap forward, as it were, to become small, what, what would your response be? Thank you. Um, the first one would really be an environment that enables anybody to come into the space to play and then allows the market to sort who stays and who becomes micro, medium, small, corporate, whatever. Uh, and so, and I, and I want to turn to, um, to, to have a handshake with policy making. I would like to say that the business facilitation bill that was passed and signed into law uh, in the last administration is a very good step in that direction because um, in, in a lot of the ways it's trying to do is enhance the effectiveness for agencies to be able to speak with each other, handshake, to the point that me interfacing, I'm interfacing with the regulatory agencies at once, not tax, not customs, not CAC, not SOM, not NAFDAQ. You know, there's a centralization and a coordination to that. And so when you then get that at once, it's easier for people to play in the space. Um, and that's one thing that even when we speak in terms of global entrepreneurship ecosystems, one of the things that is always constantly emphasized is really coordinating all the agencies that somebody running the business has to interface. And I always want to emphasize that you have to think that they, they're not corporates. They don't have somebody who is in one place. I used to work in a consulting firm before, and there are things that I didn't need to interface because there were departments that dealt with that. But as a small business in a lot of, even a SME with, you know, with, with about less than 50 employees, employees, there are things that they are not built to be interfacing with. So really just simplifying um, the policy and regulatory space um, is a significant access to that. So that's number one. 
The second point that I made around sectoral and demographic optimization helped to then um, help to enhance access to credit and market, right? Because businesses at different stages require different forms of financing and the like. And I know when we're in a space where revenue is, you know, really a challenge, um, credit can be a problem. But that's also part of the entrepreneurship ecosystem because there are people who can privately develop um, financing products that will meet the needs of the different businesses. And government does not always have to intervene except in situations where you require some form of subsidy support. Like the or way the CBN was pumping so much <laughs> into... Yes, but really also allow private sector, and there are quite a lot of people within the development space, within the private sector space, who are also developing different types of financing products. And so how do you, um, like Aurel was saying, build in technology and data in financing decisions? How do you take advantage of platforms and bills that are already there? And I go back again to the Credit Reporting Act that was passed. Can I not look for financing and let the financial provider make those decisions because of my credit history, or whether as an individual and or as a business? How do we get data and technology to be able to make um, those financing decisions easier and faster for business? Um, so that's number two. I think number three, to your point around um, looking also at subnational levels, is also then saying that how do the state governments come into play and enhance a state's entrepreneurial capacity and capability based on the comparative advantages of the state. So if you're a state that is positioned um, because of your natural resources for rice production and development, then you enhance and invest in the entire value chain for rice production. And there are people that will play there from smallholder up to large capacity manufacturers and exporters. So optimizing for the competitive advantages of states at their, at, their national, at their state and local levels and enhancing and investing in that. We cannot be all things to all men. We need to be able to say, oh, if somebody wants to run a business in fashion, so, so, and so are the best states to be able to go to because you see the inputs there, button, uh, fabric, materials, everything is there. So if somebody is, if people who are developing machinery, uh, machines for sewing machines, they go there. People who are trying to um, develop large scale um, um, uh, clothing, they go there. You know, and then another state can be TV and movie production, and that is there. Another state can be sports. Sports is something we don't talk about. So, like hubs, hubs yes, for. Yeah, so creating hubs at geographical level that speaks to the, demo, to the sectoral advantages or competitive advantages of, sub, of states and local governments, and then also looking at the human capital you have and really mar merging and, and going with that. And that's why I keep saying we need to have an entrepreneurial heart in revenue generation in Nigeria. Um, what Abu had said earlier about what are assets, our human capital, and sports is something that we've not even touched the surface about. Um, you, you, you go into places where you find a lot of young people who are confluencing around things. How can you enhance that? Do you understand? And use that as a point to, um, to create socioeconomic transformation that will generate revenue for um, the state, but also more impact, really transform uh, local, local, local economic activity uh, uh, and, and productivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Great. Please give her a round of applause. Very insightful remark. And it's, it's always important for us to realize that these things are embedded in states. And there's a way that state governments can enhance business without standing in the way, like um, uh, Mr. Sudaman said earlier. Thank you so much for that. So I think I'll just go straight to uh, uh, Mrs. Leslie, and then perhaps I'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, if there's enough time, then I would uh, continue uh, with the panel. Uh, so, um, ma'am, you, you said a lot about uh, the digital space, the digital ecosystem and brought a lot to my attention that I had previously not really known, you know, bordering on inclusivity and uh, development for women and girls. I'm kind of interested in digital literacy because I know that governments around the world, especially in developing countries, developed countries, sorry, are, have realized the importance of digital literacy skills. And perhaps we have not completely grasped that in an information age, 
people need to have those digital literacy skills that are in some way different from numeracy and regular literacy. So from your perspective, what, what kinds of strategies or interventions can be adopted, can be taken up to improve digital literacy that can also even help inclusion for vulnerable groups? Thank you for that question. Um, when we think about basic literacy, I think that in this day and age, especially when we look at the jobs of the future, the jobs of today and the jobs of the future, um, we really need to start infusing digital in them so that literacy, basic literacy, is no longer considered the ability to read and write, but the ability to read, write, and also navigate the digital space whatever tool you are using, whether it's a computer or a smartphone. So I think that, number one, we have to look at the educational um, institutions, especially the formal educational institutions, starting from primary school. It is important that all schools have this um, digital literacy built in right from, right from, let's say, primary one. But really, I mean, children in nursery are already using these tools anyway, but they are using it as consumers. It's important that we start as early as possible to introduce them to it in a meaningful and productive way. So productive way meaning that they are building and creating things with it. They are not just yeah, using games, you know, as most do. Or they are learning things like um, PowerPoint or Word in isolation or they are learning parts of a computer, which is usually where we start from. What are the parts of the computer? Hardware, software, CPU, and all that. We need to start looking at it um, from a point where we are looking at them as users and we are looking at them as future innovators. We are, so we are teaching them the skills, we are unlocking their curiosity. We are enhancing the analytical skills. So it should actually be infused in all subjects. So for instance, they're doing maths, and then they have to use, maybe um, go on the internet to do something. They're doing English. They have to use the system to write an essay or do their assignments. They're doing um, social studies. They have to get online and they have to do research because these are essential skills. You have to understand how to research. You have to understand how to find information online. You have to be able to find how to present that information. So whether that's, that's where the Microsoft Word or the PowerPoints would come in. But we're not teaching it as a standalone. We're teaching it as a tool in um, doing something, exactly, in um, enhancing a function. So I think that's how we need to actually basically look at our curriculum and where we're redesigning it. We're looking at all the different subjects and we're looking at the intersections with technology. That's really where it starts from. So that as they're growing up, they're going through school, they're already using these tools as second nature. And they're not thinking of it like, oh, I'm using the computer or I'm going to computer class or maybe I'm going to a computer camp or computer school. It's already part of what they're, they're used to. And you know, this is what's happening in many countries around the world. There's no such thing as, oh, a computer class, because it is infused in their learning totally. So I think that that's a basic that we need to start from. That's very important. So that as we're having young people who are moving through the educational system, so from primary school to secondary school, of course, by the time they, you know, they're in university, it's part of them. So I think that is very, very important to look at. Thank you so much for that, ma'am. Great, great response, really providing a level of context. Please uh, go ahead context to the need for these skills and the, the impact really on productivity and even on development. So I think we'll, I'll go straight to the audience Q&A. Please keep your question very, very brief and let us know who you're directing it to. If it's a general question, you can say it's a general question. Uh, yes, so uh, the audience, you now have the floor. Uh, I think I'll take a maximum of five, Six questions at the very most. Thank you. Okay, there's a hand raised here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the presentations and the, um, the conversations so far. So my question is directed to um, Dr. Taiwo Hoyedele. So much of the conversations are centered around the domestic economy. I mean, even your presentation as well, um, how we can, you know, 
facilitate business, the business environment in Nigeria. So I was just thinking from a policy point of view, what do you think Nigeria can do or this new administration can do to entice um, foreign capital flow into Nigeria? Right, so just from a policy point of view, I would just like to hear your views on um, external sector, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do I go ahead? Yes, yes go ahead, Okay, sir. thank you very much, very good question. So, um, you know, the popular saying is there can be no development without investment. So for any economy to grow, you need investment, and those investments would be both domestic, but also even external investment. Um, external investment is sometimes even more important because not only is it bringing you investment, it's giving you forest liquidity, which helps you to stabilize your foreign exchange, uh, exchange rates. Now, what has happened, and because you know people who work in my role uh, deal with a lot of multinationals and foreign investors, uh, so the questions they've been asking in the past few years um, have been very few, and they haven't seen the questions to the end. And it's very predictable. If you say, you know, there's um, a best, you know, whatever it is, party or carnival in the world that you can't wait to get into it, but say, you know what, there's no assurance that you'll come back. Do you think anybody will go? Nobody wants to bring their currency and their investment into Nigeria when they can't take it out when they need to. I think now that's why not only we have excitement in Nigeria, we have it globally about Nigeria, but they're still waiting to see how we then follow through. Once we start following through, first you see significant foreign portfolio investment returning to the capital market. It used to be significant before. Then more importantly is the patient capital, foreign direct investment to build factories, industries, and so on and so forth. I think the way to do it is for government to be very clear with their policies. They need to be thoughtful about those policies, and they need to apply them consistently, consistently under similar circumstances. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Great, great question. Can we have another a question from the audience? We still have two other speakers, just in case. OK. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, speakers, um, I probably would direct my question to the SME ladies. Um, the keynote speaker says something about um, looking for the money, and then the missing link was in the SME space. That's why the draft he drew. And then, if I think back, the government has done a lot to try to pull the SME sector up. Like uh, you would say, the, um, to ease capital, the legislation for movable assets would probably provide ease of capital. Um, there's a body, the SME body. There's also been a lot of money by the government that has been thrown to the SMEs. But with all of this government efforts, nothing has come out from the SME. Now, do you think? maybe we should look beyond government support and also look into the SME. Issues of moral trust, issues of moral risk. I don't think this should be addressed and then probably that can provide um, a way forward to try to pull the sector up. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I was actually focused on what the government can do and that's where I focused on. But you bring a very good point around the capacity of the MSMEs themselves to be able to build sustainable businesses, to be able to take access, when access is given, to be able to utilize it effectively and grow a business. And that's why I said that it still goes back to the design of the programs and the policies. Where programs and policies are effectively designed, you target the ones, even at nano levels, that are able to effectively utilize the funds you give to grow. Even if you then made a mistake in the assessing, there's a way that the process, you understand, is developed that you won't make the same mistake again because you learn from it. So on the one part, you talk about capacity. You know, a lot of when Aurel was speaking around financial and digital literacy, there are gaps. There are gaps even with our educational system that is feeding into the kind of entrepreneurs that we have. 
um, I, 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 one example I always use is that people have a, I had a math phobia. And so if you have a math phobia, everything you see with numbers, you know, scares you. I, I still have a math phobia. Uh, I, I had, oh, I had, thank God for um, people who were able to teach me how to look at numbers in a way that I then use now. But that is impacting the way start and build, people start and build businesses, general speaking, because it's not just about the idea, but it's your ability to be able to transform that idea and create a sustainable and venture with it. And that's where I think between the supply and the demand is. Yes, there are funds that have been made. There's one presentation we have that has a whole dimension of the different types of MSME funding that has been created and sort of like the lessons from that. And that's the point. What are the lessons from that, right? So much funding has been invested. In fact, we don't even think that enough has been invested. It's just that what was invested was not probably invested in the most productive sector within that space. And so the returns that we get on that investment is not there. But there's also the other part around capacitating um, the entrepreneurs to be able to take advantage of, of those opportunities. And that's also why I spoke on, there are quite a lot of people doing so many things now to support and enhance businesses. Um, we don't think, for instance, that is in the space of government to be training. Even funding, it's like it's need-based. It's in emergency situations that you step in. There are a lot of development partners, there are a lot of private sector locally that are also doing a lot of that investment in building support, in enablement, in mentoring services, and the like. It's that gap in between to say, how do we ensure that there's an effective coordination system at the government and that allows players who wants to support entrepreneurs at whatever space, whatever capacity, with whatever products as the like, and also making sure that um, the, so, at, so that they can come in and be able to address that, that's number one. But also then saying that you also build, better build the capacity of anybody who wants to run a business, so you make sure that the space is, is accessible to whoever wants to play, but the market, if allowed to play freely, play, will flush out the businesses that are not meant to exist. Um, it sounds a bit, a bit harsh, but really that's, that's what you want to have to come, to come into play. Um, so there are different elements to your conversation, but yes, I do agree that there's a role that the, the entrepreneur, the venture leader themselves too, also has to play in that success. Thank you. Can I add to that as well? So those yes, are please. extremely wonderful points. And um, Adenike is right. When you actually have a program that is tailored and designed well, you actually see the impacts. You see the entrepreneurs come out. They are stronger. Their businesses thrive. Their businesses are scaling up. They are hiring more people. They are more, they're more profitable. I think that we also need to look at the environments that the, the, the enterprises are operating in. And it's challenging. So I think that from that point of view, there is really a lot that has to be addressed. And I think we've spoken about a lot of it. Multiple taxes, levies, um, which are not official or officially recognized and just the, the, the difficulty in doing businesses. You need a license for this, but that license is not easy to get. You have to pay extra. Yeah, so it's a really, really challenging um, environment. Then there are the added costs as well. You have electricity mm -hmm. that you have to generate for yourself. So that's you know increasing your expense as well. So there are a lot of things that are really crippling mm -hmm. you know, this space. So any entrepreneur that is surviving, I really have to put, you know, give them, you know, thumbs up or put my hands up to them because it really is a difficult space to, you know, to survive in. So the trainings are good, the funding is good, but like Adinik has said, it's nearly not enough. The funding that you see, you know, other entrepreneurs in other countries have access to is a whole lot more. But yeah, maybe it comes, you know, it comes with a program that is more thoughtfully designed. But then they are also operating in environments where it is easier. They don't have to think about, oh, I get to the office, someone has locked my office because I didn't pay radio and TV license. There's no light. I can't afford petrol. It's one thing after the other. So. <laughs> It is. It's a very, very punitive system. It's a, it's, when I say punitive, it is. Sometimes you will just speak with entrepreneurs, and they are dealing with so many agents and agents, and that's what they've spent 30 to 40% of their day doing. Even if you look at the cost of them running the business and where the money goes to it, it can be very, very harsh. And 
you know, the, why I like the word ecosystem is that an entrepreneur cannot grow beyond the opportunities in the environment and the possibilities in the environment that they're in. So even when you find entrepreneurs doing well, you are then saying that, imagine, that's why we have so many of our entrepreneurs, they go to Canada, they go to the UK, and they're winning business awards because the environment, and it's not like the environment there is perfect too. There are also so many issues with that. But you allow the uh, environment and the market, right, to weed out the non-perfect. The customers, if you're putting a product to the market that is not good, the customers will make the decision for that. So once you've sorted out the things that enable a businesses to thrive, get out of the way. The market would allow them to play to grow effectively well. And then it goes back again to the program design. When we design these programs, we've not done the work required to say, what are we designing for? How are we testing and learning from that experiences? If we've assumed that jobs we could be created, and this is saying that we don't have incidences like COVID and all of that happening, what do we want to see that is showing that is doing well? What is the growth that we want to see in these businesses? In what way are those growths evidence? You, you really have to put that investment to test and learn and then reinvest or, you know, you say, okay, was well, a pilot is good, it worked, and then it, it goes away. One of the most successful, I'm sorry, I'm taking that, one of the most successful initiatives, and if you, if you check around on the internet is there, was um, that the business plan competition that um, the Ministry of Finance did with the World Bank during, um, during Okonjo, a well last time. And they will tell you that, again, it wasn't perfect, but they will tell you that that show, that was one of the most successful government financing programs that has happened. Because you put in capital, but there are milestones to that capital. You're not giving people money at once. So yes, you have five million, but this 100K, for you to get, then get the next 500, we need to see this. If we don't see this, we'll first of all check to see if there was an anomaly. And you know, maybe we'll look at it again. And so there's milestone around that. And if we, if we don't, if we're not intentional in designing large scale programs, we're just going to be flushing money down and then the entrepreneurs too are then frustrated because they feel oh all this money is going there it's not coming our way but the, the government is also frustrated because the money is not um, deriving the returns that we expect to see and that's also why I said that private sector needs to be investing more in this type of spaces because when you are putting down one naira you you know how you you expect to see the returns from it thank you thank you thank you very much for that um, can we have one, two more questions at the very most. Uh, if you don't ask, please, it's even good for me. I also have more questions for them, so. Uh, the mic is uh, going around. None? Okay, there's someone at the back in a uh, gray jacket. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My question is to the lady on black. I, she talked about digital, the opportunities within the digital space. So my question to her is, do you think that government should have a role to play when it comes to helping the youth develop tech skills that can enable them work both at home and abroad? Because we know these days, people, someone in Nigeria can work for a brand in US, in UK, as long as you have some test skills, programming, and all sorts of other test skills. Do you think the government should have a role to play in doing that? Because it's not enough to have a degree in one thing or the other. This day is all about practical. What can you do? Those some brands are, are abroad no longer even ask you how many degrees do you have, but can you do this? So do you think the government should have a role to play in helping this you develop test skills beyond the whatever certificate they already have? Test skills that can help them move further because Let's take India, for example. The India is more like dominating the tech space. Why? Because they had a kind of a road map or a plan over the years. And today, most of the softwares, the apps we use are developed by Indian. If you check your phone, I'm sure that nearly 30% are developed by Indians alone. Either that the Indian develop it for another brand abroad, or they develop it on their own. Is there a way we can be able to achieve something like that? Because we have the numbers as well, just as they do. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I, I think that government has a role to play in creating an environment where this is possible, where it's possible for young people to develop these skills, where it's possible for young people to thrive. I had spoken earlier about the curriculum and the, the importance of having a relevant curriculum for today's world. So it is important, number one, to go back and review that. And government certainly you know, has a role to play in doing that. Um, and then I think also in terms of, if we're talking about like running training programs, I think that there are organizations that are doing that. Um, so I think that government should provide a space where these organizations can thrive. I think a lot of these organizations are on the ground and they know the realities of the spaces that they are working in. I don't think that government needs to get into everything because it's, it's inefficient. Government has run programs, and I have also been involved with some of them, where they were directly funding or raising the funding for digital um, literacy programs. And I mean, I, I think you know that's fine, but I think that really the major focus should be ensuring that there is an environment where, number one, so we have the access to the curriculum, and the curriculum is relevant, because this is going to be in public and private schools. Then we have access to the infrastructure as well, because without the infrastructure, whether that's access to the computers, the, the um, digital devices, as well as internet. I think that the cost of internet really needs to come way down. That is so crucial because if you don't have that, you can't say that you are learning digital skills like offline because it's all interwoven. So, and government does have a role to play in making sure that at least we have a competitive environment where data prices can go down and so internet is available for everyone who wants to use it, which really should be everyone. I think it's also important to have access points as well, where people, if they don't have maybe a smartphone or they don't have access to a computer, there are actually places that they can go to and they can access these things. In other countries, um, public libraries are a place where people can go to, and there are really hubs in the community. There are computers there, there's the internet, and then there are all sorts of classes, whether it's like a graphic design class or it's something else. There are hubs in the community where the people, whether it's young and old, can go to. They can use the devices, they can access classes and learning. That's very important. Um, a few years ago, there was this initiative called Code Lagos. I'm sure a lot of us have heard about it. And the aim was to um, train uh, a million Lagosians in digital skills. And the digital skills they were looking at were um, Scratch, Python programming. Um, and it was freely available in all public schools and some private schools as well. And if you are not enrolled in a school, it was the classes were also available in libraries. So I mean, I like that project because it was a really good collaboration and it was using resources that are already there. There are already public libraries, and I'm sure many of you don't even know the nearest public library that is close to you. Lagos has at least, at last count, they had like about 12. There are state public libraries and also um, federally funded um, libraries as well. And these are hubs that, well, they are potentially hubs anyway. They are spaces that can be used. And we can see, um, if you know the library on Herbert Macaulay in Yaba, that was taken over by GTB and they redid it. I mean, if you had seen it before, it was an old ramshackle building. But by the time they had taken it over, as part of their CSR, they did it up, they equipped it with computers, with the internet. So the Code Lagos program was actually running in there. And even now that the Code Lagos program no longer exists, the library is there and it's a hub in the community. So I think that the government can certainly support and provide that environment in which you know these kind of initiatives can thrive. Even if government is not the one actually running the programs, but they're in partnership with um, the private sector and also civil society as well. Just a quick point. Um, I think one other thing that government can do, I know the uh, new president said he wants to try and create one million digital jobs. Um, so one thing that government can do is to remove some of the impediments towards Nigerians being able to play in that space. Um, I have two multinational companies that have sent inquiries to me before because they want to hire Nigerians in Nigeria. But once you're done with the analysis, they don't show up again. Why? Because we had laws we had inherited from our colonial masters before the internet was invented that says 
as of today, if you are, for example, a US company or UK, uh, British company, and you hire Nigerians in Nigeria, the law says not only would those Nigerians pay taxes, you that you hire them must come to Nigeria to pay taxes. So I'm going to then say to myself, I'm a US company looking for smart people. If I can hire them in Kenya and India, why do I bother about Nigeria? So those impediments we must remove. We had a report at PwC that we call Brain Capital, where we've projected that we can easily get up to two million jobs within the global value chain. These guys don't have to leave Nigeria. They will earn dollars, pay taxes. It will help us with foreign exchange. We just need to fix that small problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, sir. Please, let's give them a round of applause. I think it would not be overstating it to say that since this uh, new administration is yet to appoint ministers, it can choose from amongst our speakers here. Please just make me your special assistant. That's all I ask. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you for your time, uh, for the audience as well. Uh, this is a first of a kind for budget, really, looking to the private sector. A lot of the conversations we have in our organization tend to be with the public sector and with organizations like ours. But speaking more to the private sector and the people in that space uh, is meant to enhance the work that we do. And we are delighted to have you attend uh, the first of its kind for us. Uh, please, let's give another round of applause to our panelists as we excuse them back to their seats. And we call upon the, the host. OK. OK, pictures. All right, because we quickly have them on stage, let's quickly take our pictures with them now, and then we will wrap things up. Uh, Shion will come with the closing remarks. Are two board members with budgets joining Shion for this picture now. Like the river I've been running, mm, running ever since. Yes, all right, please let's give more. let's give all of our speakers a round of applause one more time, giving their time and of course their attention today uh, for everything that they've shared with us. And I do hope that we have been able to take away some valuable things. I'm going to hand over to Shion for the closing remarks, and then they'll be networking. Um, thank you so much. I don't want to be the one to be between you and your uh, lunch. This closing room actually has been done by Mr. Olajide, but it's an available accent. Um, I want to thank you so much for your patience. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, our keynote speakers, our speakers, Mr. Thai, well, you did it. Well, you did it. came in very, very early. Thank you so much for your commitment. Interesting, we had this session when Buari was there in 2015. And it was also in that event. So we're really grateful and thankful for always showing up at this time. And we hope, you know, another, another span of has started again. We hope this time it's, it's better and it's different. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Deni Kadiyemi. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Um, Aurelo uh, Shomoli Listen. Thank you so much for your incredible presentations. I want to also thank all everyone that has been our guests. Thank you so much for coming and for your participation and for your attention into this. Um, this is the beginning of a great conversation. So we will start continuous engagement. Everything we have done here, we'll go back and listen to it over again. We'll come up with a policy note, which is what we did in the previous time. And we'll share. I mean, I remember then we shared with the vice president, um, Professor Yemi Oshibaja, and we had some conversation with him in the early stage. And I don't know what went wrong at the end of the day, but uh, I still have that document. Uh, I'm sure some of you in budget have seen it. Uh, we call it finding money for Buari or something like that. Um, yeah, but this time again, we'll go back to the same people, the technical team, the presidency and co, and share some of the findings in here. 
we hope that they would listen um, because time is ticking and we are running out of choices. Thank you so much, the budget team. Thank you, Victoria. Where is Victoria? Please let me call Victoria. Um, Victoria has been a lone woman team. It's a lone man team, but she's been a lone woman team who's anchored the entire uh, entire work, and she's gotten great support. She's not around. She's gotten great support from the entire team, research, comms, and everyone. We're still going to take pictures as budget team at the end of this. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shell. Um, Shell and myself have a long-standing relationship, <laughs> and we also are actually. Should we say village people are be town people at this point? We're Ogwomosho people, so the, <laughs> we met and then we found out we had uh, family connections. But it's been a fantastic um, opportunity once again to work with Budget on these conversations. Please share your thoughts. I see some conversations online already. Taiwo, um, your presentation, all of the presentations have been a hit and there are questions. And that's what we're trying to encourage and inspire. Nigerians who ask questions and who demand accountability from those that we have vested power power in. Uh, Taiwo mentioned a, um, um, a report that PwC did on brain exports, and I actually spoke to their chief economist. So if you're interested in looking at what PwC is projecting in terms of what Nigeria can get from brain, brain exports, you can go to New Central's YouTube channel, and that conversation with Dr. Andrew Naveen is there. My name is Solu Lokwe Adila Rubalogun. This is, I guess, a side gig. My main gig is on New Central, which is a pan-African television station. I'm head of programs. I also do the business show. I'm I do a lot of things. So um, I'm always here and available, so any conversation. So please use the opportunity to network after this. Take pictures as well. The ushers will come to each table when it's time to eat, so let's please do that in an orderly fashion as well. But in the meantime, take your pictures, network, ask your questions. The, the speakers are still here, but don't bombard them. Let's also not just you know crowd them a little bit too much. I know that happens after events like this. But once again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is brought to you by Budget and, of course, supported by the MacArthur Foundation and we look forward to more conversations like this. Thank you, and have a pleasant afternoon.